nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut That's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut You know, when most people get interested in nature, the easiest thing to pay attention to is things like birds and flowers and mammals. But there's so much more to the natural world than that. There's so much more that we usually don't see. The world of the small things, the unseen things. And today, we're going to look at one particular aspect of that small unseen world, the world of tiger beetles. Now me, I've been into tiger beetles for a long time. I discovered this book at an early age in the public library. Well, not this exact book. This is my own copy of the book I gave their copy back, which is, you know, the responsible thing to do. They sold it or something. They don't have it anymore, but I still have mine. Look at this. Look at this. To John on his 14th birthday from Mom and Dad, The Sissendella Day of Canada. This is a book that allows you to identify any species of tiger beetle in Canada. Now, that may not sound too terribly interesting to you now, but to me, whew! A windfall, a very major, major discovery, and I was delighted. Started going out chasing tiger beetles with my friends Kate and Bob, and Kate's family got involved in it. They used to take their summer vacations looking for tiger beetles. Tiger beetles, excellent things. We'll get back to what tiger beetles are in a minute. And I became just a little bit fixated on these beetles, and eventually wound up writing a thesis on the tiger beetles of Western Canada in sand dune environments. Look, see, I'm not faking it. This is a thesis. Would you like me to read you some of it? Hmm, perhaps I should. You know, I, the one problem with writing this thing was I gave a copy to my parents and they tried to read it and they said, John, I'm sorry, we don't have any clue what you've been doing for the last couple of years, but it is a nice thick little piece of work, isn't it? Which I appreciated. You know, I'm not going to read it to you. If I, the same thing will happen. It's confusing. These, by the way, are tiger beetles. And one of the things that's confusing about them is they all have confusing names. Their names start with the word Sisindela, which is their genus, although some people pronounce it Sisindela and some people pronounce it Sisindela. And so many of them have species names that start with L. So, for example, this is Sisindela limbata, and so is that, and that, and that, and that, for that matter. This is Sisindela lepida, and this is Sisindela lengi, and there is also Sisindela lungilabris and Sisindela limbalis. And boy, you start talking like that, people's eyes cloud over and they uh, don't want to listen anymore. The name Sisindela means glow worm, even though they don't glow and they aren't worms. Let me tell you, it's a great world, the world of tiger beetles. Let me show you, instead of reading to you, what tiger beetles are all about. An open sand dune, the perfect sort of place to look for tiger beetles. They like open places, they like beaches, they like alkali flats, they like river banks, that sort of spot. Oh, this is great. You know, it takes me right back to my grad student days when I was a carefree guy in search of adventure and tiger beetles. Tiger beetles are called tiger beetles because some of them are striped like tigers, but they're also little carnivores, little predators. They are the terrors of the open sand. And to catch them, you have to think like a tiger beetle. Tiger beetles have huge eyes to, to look for their prey. They have long legs to run after their prey, and they have big jaws to chew up their prey. They also fly readily, which means they usually escape. So you have to be as sneaky as they are. You have to watch for them about two meters in front of you. And when you see one, and I might just see one right now, you sneak up on it and pounce. If they fly, watch where they fly, watch where they land. Quite a simple matter. Pay close attention. I'm going to use my own personal favorite technique, the pounce technique. You get in low, and at the last moment, you just pounce on it with the neck. Fire! 
You gotta be faster than that. These are not easy beetles to catch. Oh, there's another one. I got him, I got him, I got him, I got him. Ooh. Come here, have a look at this. It's a Sicindula tranquibarica. You pick them up out of the net, and they're quite tough little guys. And I always like to let them bite me on the finger because that's what they like to do, and it kind of, you know, pays them back for all the trouble I've caused them. They can't really pierce your skin. It doesn't really hurt when they bite you. Only the biggest ones can pierce the skin and draw blood. This one isn't quite big enough to do that, especially when I give them my uh, guitar playing fingers with the thick calluses. Ouch! I lied, sorry. The biggest tiger beetles live in Southern Africa and have jaws that could fit around a finger. Now, if you're not very good at pouncing, there are a few other techniques you could try. Here's the uh, the Gary technique, named after my friend Gary. He's, you know, kind of big. He doesn't pounce that well. You just sort of sneak up and go like that. Hopefully you catch the beetle. No pounce involved. Or my friend Ted, who's too cool to pounce, he just sort of swishes past the beetle and hopes that it'll fly up into the net. Most of the time, you swish right past it, it laughs and goes the other direction. Or you could try the Thompson technique. It looks very cool but it never works. Sporty though, remember to look over your shoulder, see if you caught anything. In temperate places, tiger beetles are mostly ground dwellers, but some tropical species live up in trees. Identifying tiger beetles is quite easy, really. You just have to look at the pattern of stripes. Most of the time you have to look at nothing more than the pattern of stripes or blotches on their wing covers, this part on the back of their body, and you need diagrams like this. These uh, diagrams show the pattern. Usually their tiger beetles are drawn without any legs and without any antennae and most some of the time without any bodies as well. You see each one has a different pattern on the wing cover. These are the wing covers of the seven species that we might find around here. And you can see that this one matches both this pattern and that pattern, but it's dark brownish black, not reddish. So it is Cicindula tranquibarica. Not this guy, Cicindula lengi. I had a Cicindula lengi. I was going to show it to you, but this fellow ate it. These things happen. Okay, and we'll let this little guy go. Be free, tiger beetle. Fly readily. Clean your antenna first. Whoo, be free. So if you, if you need to, um, to find those sorts of diagrams for tiger beetles in your area, don't fear, go to the library, and even if you can't find a book about tiger beetles on the shelves, talk to the librarian. Hey, librarians, at least the best librarians, they go to university for years, and every day people come up to them and ask them where the washroom is and where the change for the photocopy machine. If you ask them how to find a book on Sissendelidae, they'll be delighted. It'll be a big challenge. Make their day. Under a microscope, even the brown parts of a tiger beetle are made up of thousands of colorful dots. So have I convinced you yet? Have you decided to become one of us tiger beetlers? You could always start a tiger beetle collection. That's the traditional thing to do. Or you could go out, catch tiger beetles, look at them in your hands, and then let them go. Don't forget, though, you can also use binoculars. Most people, they say, ha, you can't use binoculars on bugs, and they do this kind of thing, and they give up. Well, that's not how you do it. That's the dumb way to use binoculars. You have to get the bug a little further away from the binoculars, and then they work fine. Okay, go. Interesting, I told you they had very interesting behavior. Tiger beetle, behave yourself, go. It's just like a sandstorm. Other way. Go, go, go. There we go. Now we'll see some behavior. As you follow them up and down over the twisting terrain of their topography, you notice that at some points they are completely out of view. That's the time when you can't say a thing about their behavior because it's not visible. 
You can guess what they're doing. Perhaps it's digging a burrow, perhaps. Oh, there it is. This is an old tiger beetle. You can see that by the kind of coffee stained looking wing covers on this particular individual. They love sunny weather. And the sunnier the weather, the hotter the ground, the hotter the sand surface. The beetles at first, when they first emerge from their overnight burrows, will hug the sand very closely. They will bask in the solar radiation, warm up, then they run around looking for food and mates, and as it gets hotter and hotter outside, they rise higher and higher on their toes until they are right up on tiptoes, all six of them, uh, in a position we call stilting. Once it becomes too hot to stilt, they start moving between shade and the sun, and they'll cool down in the shade, get up their nerve, run out into the sun, find something to eat, run back into the shade, and so on and so forth, and maintain their body temperature at an even, oh, say, 28 degrees, about there, for the rest of the day. Highly interesting. If it gets too hot, even in the shade, they'll dig a burrow, and they will spend the rest of the day in the burrow. It's warm enough still on the sand in, on this overcast day that this beetle can remain active, but if it gets much cooler, the beetle might have to dig a burrow to escape the cold for the rest of the day. Tiger beetles are neither helpful nor harmful to people, although many of us find them both beautiful and fascinating. Ah, now here is a tiger beetle larval burrow. What that means is that in the bottom of this little burrow there is a tiger beetle larva. The way you recognize these burrows is they are usually perfectly circular. They look like somebody poked a drinking straw into the ground. And they're different from these ant holes because the ant holes are not perfectly circular and they have little piles of sand around them. In the bottom of this burrow, he's hiding right now, is a tiger beetle larva, the tiger beetle equivalent of a caterpillar, the thing that turns into a tiger beetle, a baby tiger beetle, in effect. Without digging up his burrow and destroying his little life, let me show you what he would, uh, he would be like if we could see through the ground. A tiger beetle larva is kind of a grubby thing, uh, but the, the head is perfectly circular and fills the top of that burrow when they're waiting for their prey. The jaws stick straight up, and stupid little bugs come walking along. The tiger beetle larva reaches back with its head, grabs the, the uh, intended victim with the jaws, and drags it down the burrow to consume it. What if they grab something that's a little bit uh, bigger than they expected, something quite tough? Well, then they hold on with their legs, they hold on with the end of their abdomen, and they have little hooks on the back of their abdomen that dig into the side of the burrow, and they can just pull and go and pull the little bugs down into the burrow and uh, consume them down there. If you want to see a tiger beetle larva, you can dig their burrows up, but sometimes they're many, many feet deep. What I like to do is take a blade of grass uh, or a grass stem and poke that down the burrow and see if the larva is home that way. Let's give it a try. So you get yourself a blade of grass and you trim it so there are no parts poking out the sides. This is a very fiddly procedure. I think I saw chimpanzees do something like this with termite mounds in Africa. I didn't see it, saw it on TV. Best place to see this kind of thing. And then you just take your, uh, it's not a blade of grass, pardon me, it's a stem of grass, and you put it down the hole very gently. I mean, you could wait here for hours until the little larva comes up to the top of the burrow to look for bugs, but uh, this is an easier way to do it. And you put it down the burrow. Oh, what's happening? That's not deep enough. There's, there can't be a larva in there. You must have abandoned this hole. Let's try this other hole here. I didn't tell you about that one. And maybe there'll be somebody down there. Oh, that's much better. Look at how deep that is. Some of them, I mean, some of them go down three feet, a uh, meter, that kind of thing. No, I can't tell. Is that moving? Oh, it is moving. It is moving. It is moving. He's down there. And then you just sort of pull. You tease him. You fight with him. You have a little wrestle. And... Is he coming up? Is he coming up? No. He chickened out. You get the idea, though. 
you poke it down, you, and then eventually the little guy will come up to the surface, and then you go, boom, and he pops back down. Tiger beetles chew their food well, but they only swallow the juice. Take my word for it, after years of experience, I believe that watching tiger beetles on an open, dry, sunny sand dune in the middle of summer is a great way to get heat stroke. The good thing is you can take them inside, set them up in a terrarium, and watch them in the comfort of your own home. Making a tiger beetle terrarium is actually quite easy. All you need is a terrarium, some uh, soil from the place that you found the tiger beetles at, and you have to make sure that at least part of the soil is wet so that they can chew on it and get the moisture that they need. In here I have a bunch of Sisindla lengai, beautiful things from uh, an open sand dune area. And over in this tank some lovely purple Sisindla limbalis, some bronzy colored Sisindla rapenda, and some mud colored Sisindla duodecim gateta, which means 12 spotted. So uh, they're all doing very well. The cool thing is, too, that you don't, I mean, you can feed them bugs, but you don't have to. You can throw in little bugs and worms and so on, and they will, of course, pounce on them and rip them apart. But if you want, you can also give them puppy chow, or any, I'm, I'm sure any kind of dog food would work, but it's an amazing thing. Beetle scientists have discovered that the perfect beetle food for tiger beetles and ground beetles is, for some reason, 
dry puppy chow. Any kind of puppy chow will do. You just moisten it, put it in with the beetles. Oop, got some water on the glass there. And they eat it, just as if it was something normal and natural. And these things have been kept alive for long periods of time, being fed nothing but puppy chow. Isn't that nice? And you can, you can watch them in your terrarium and you'll see them doing all the things that they would naturally do. You can see them running around on their tiptoes because they're nice and warm. You can see them mating. You can see them fighting with one another. And sometimes you even get eggs and uh, little baby larvae in your uh, terrarium, which is neat too. Oh, there's that little Leng is eating the puppy chow. It's a great way to get more familiarity with tiger beetles without, like I say, spending too much time being sandblasted and heat stroked on the open dunes. So I've been at this tiger beetle thing for more than 20 years now. You'd think that maybe I was getting a little bored of them, but no chance. What do you do after 20 years when you've got hundreds of these tiger beetle specimens with pins through them and little labels on them? Well, one thing you can do, what I'm doing, so don't you do it, is to do a study of the mandibles, the jaws of the tiger beetles of the world. And that's what I'm up to now with my friend and entomological mentor, Professor Ball at the University of Alberta. What we've done, as we've taken beetles like this, we take the, the dead beetles, we take their jaws out of their head, we mount them on little pins, we coat them with pure gold, and we put them in a scanning electron microscope, which is a huge microscope. It's bigger than the washer and the dryer and the fridge and the stove all put together. And uh, that thing bombards the jaw with electrons and gives you these wonderful little pictures of tiger beetle jaws, which you can then examine in great detail and come up with uh, names for every little bump and ridge and that sort of thing, and figure out how these beetles are related to one another, how one sort of jaw evolved into another. You see, the problem is this. Almost all of our knowledge of tiger beetle classification and relationships comes from scientists who have looked at the back end of the tiger beetle, at the genitalia, the knotty bits, as they say in entomological circles, and they have concluded that tiger beetles are related thus and so. So we decided, hey, let's break some new ground, let's go wild, let's look at the front end of the beetle, let's look at the jaws. Maybe someday we'll come back and look at the middle of the beetle, but for now we're having a great time, and uh, you know, it's good. You know, there are all sorts of people who love tiger beetles. Maybe you'll be the next ones. I know kids who love tiger beetles, university students. I know retired people who spend every bit of their spare time looking for tiger beetles and watching tiger beetles. I know doctors and lawyers and all. Oh, it's a great thing for anyone. I hope I've convinced you. Do you like my tiger beetle disguise? I've decided to move among them and see if they will accept me as one of their own tribe. Until next time, I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. Always clean your antenna first. Hurry up! Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit. I'm wild about the wild things, and I'm proud of it. I'm just a simple case, open and shut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut. <laughs>